That's what <clears throat> we're live. <laughs> See, or that I just didn't realize that that's what it was. Yeah. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, version of the Forlorn Dopes with your hosts, me, Cyber Smiley, and I am Wisdom zero zero zero. And greetings, programs. We have an exciting episode today. Yes, we do. We have uh, a guest from uh, our Talsorian. Mr. Jay Gray himself. Myself, that's true. Hello, everybody. The media ambassador. That is that is one of my job titles. We are uh, we're big time now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you're, 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 James Hutt, by the way, asked me to say hello to you both. Oh, hello, James. Yeah. We hello, we James. might try to get him on um, yeah. in the near future and talk about some of the uh, choices in red, but. Until then, um, so normally for those who are, are regular uh, listeners and for you, Jay, uh, me and uh, Wisdom here just rattle on about like what's happened in the past couple of weeks with a cyberpunk genre itself. So we talk about movies we watch, television series that are coming out, uh, the computer game, etc. But we're going to kind of skip that because I know uh, your time is short. So we're gonna try to get right into this. Um, it is. If I not, if I'm not out of here by, if I don't out of here on time, I die. <laughs> yes. I, I, well, maybe I turn into a, a scaly reptile monster. I'm not sure. Well, if you have a spouse, I know my spouse has certain time limits on certain things, and if I do not comply, there's often uh, payback for it. So let's get started. So first, um, sure. we came up with a, a questionnaire. We call it the full auto questionnaire. It's going to be short questions with short answers. Um, there's no wrong answers, but there is one right answer in this list. So hopefully you'll get the right okay. answer. All right. We'll first, see. first question, 2020, 2045 or 2077? Oof. See, that's not an easy question. All of them. Okay. What's your favorite? What's your favorite role? Oh, my favorite. Oh, my my favorite is 2045. Okay. My favorite is 2045, but that's that's because that's the one I'm spending the most time in. Okay. Next question is your favorite role. Favorite role? I do not have one. That's okay. the honest truth. Whatever role is good for the character I'm making. Favorite piece of cyberware? Uh, Chiron, or else Times Square Marquee, as it used to be called. Yeah. Uh, favorite weapon. Oh, you know what? That is tough. Um, I can't talk about my favorite weapon. Because <laughs> oh. it hasn't been published yet? Something coming out, huh? It, it, it's something that's in Black Chrome, and I can't talk about it yet. Oh. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll tell you it is the single most ridiculous gun I've ever seen in my entire life, though. So next question is, favorite Cyberpunk Red or 2020 book? Um, Night City. Uh, no, no. Least favorite Cyberpunk Red 2020 book? Black Hand's Guide, because it doesn't really tell the story that the others do. Ooh. Uh, you know, I can actually, I can empathize with that. That's. <laughs> Next uh, I've never put that into words, but it leaves out a lot of the, a lot of the flavor. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Next question. Pan Am, Judy, or Rogue? Uh, Rogue to work for, Judy to hang out with. Carrie River or Goro? Goro. Dude, how could you not? I was going to say, that's really much of a question there. <laughs> I like River. Actually, I do like River. He's, a, he, he's, he's you know, I appreciate it. A guy that's into his family, but 
Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna hang out with with a with cool samurai guy. Uh, favorite yeah. Night City gang. Uh, the albino alligators. Hmm. Hmm. Favorite mega corporation. Bad. Oof. Favorite mega corporation. Ziggurat. Favorite cyberpunk movie. Does it have to be a movie? It could be any broadcast medium. Uh, it sure. could be any broadcast medium. Max Hedrum, the uh, original TV show. Nice. Uh, always a favorite. Uh, favorite cyberpunk fictional character. Mm, Faith from Mirror's Edge. This week, anyway. <laughs> Gibson, Dix, or <laughs> Stevenson? Like Sorry, say Gibson who? Gibson, Dix, or Stevenson? Um, John Walter Williams. I feel like I need to be loyal. Okay, that's good. Uh, favorite cyberpunk novel? Really? Over Effinger? What? Over Effinger? Um, well, you know, Effinger wasn't a playtester in the original cyberpunk. Oh, okay. that's, that's true. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. Favorite cyberpunk novel? Mm. I see. I just, I just said John Walter Williams, but I am going to actually go with Neuromancer. Um, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I am going to get in trouble for this. Um, no. It is. I actually am blanking on the name. Um, it is the, uh, Steve Kenson uh, wrote a couple of Shadowrun novels. I really enjoyed as cyberpunk. Um, centered around a character in Boston, and I liked it because it's the only cyberpunk I've ever read set in Boston. Okay. Which is, uh, I'm from Massachusetts, so. Got it. So, uh, and the final question is: Is Shadowrun cyberpunk? Mm. It's small, it's small C. Small C. Small I'm assuming. C. Wrong. Uh, That's the only wrong answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, uh, the the answer the answer that is, is no uh, <laughs> genre. It's what you uh, make of it. I actually have a lot of respect for a lot of the writing in Shadowrun, especially in Duncan uh, uh, Last Will and Testament. But, I, I uh, like Shadowrun as yeah. as it is, but I don't consider yeah. it cyberpunk. I think I think um, once you start, I, it, it's it's a tough line. Obviously, there are things that aren't. There's also these lines where, like, someone will say, this isn't cyberpunk because blah, because it doesn't fight against the corporations. So this one is not cyberpunk because you can play a cop, or mm. this one is not cyberpunk because uh, cyber psychosis exists. And like that's, and that's like cyberpunk, if you take Judge Dredd, Ghost in the Shell, Neuromancer, you put them side by side, there are certain things in common, but they're all very tonally different at the same time. But I would say they're all cyberpunk. Yeah, but there's from for me, cyberpunk is about near future, hard science, dystopian. Um, should not include any type of supernatural or magic. Uh, sure. Should include in aliens, because then you start getting into these other genres. And and I, so, I don't mind. So Blade Runner is not cyberpunk. Blade Runner didn't have aliens. But the Blade Runner shares the universe with aliens. Yeah, true. All right, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, you, no, you are right. Actually, um, there is a policy in uh, an unofficial official policy in RTG that there are certain technologies that we once you get there are certain technological thresholds that once you pass them, you move from cyberpunk to space opera and far future. Yep. And while aliens themselves aren't. Um, uh, there is a point where, like, you know, interstellar travel is not really as much. Uh, that that's one of the thresholds. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so that's the the quick, the the, the quick, quick questions, the the oh. full auto. Now on to okay. uh, actual questions that relate to you and and the work you do and our Talsorian. Yes. So. Let's, let's talk um, about that. Yeah, so let's. Uh, so the first questions uh, we had were basically how you got started with RTG. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I stopped gaming for a long while. Uh, I moved from North Carolina to New York uh, 
for various reasons. Uh, in New York, North Carolina, I had a gaming group. In New York, I could not find one. Not New York City, New York State. Uh, I could not find a gaming group, and I stopped, like, stopped gaming for a while, and this was before the rise of online play. Uh, and then uh, I was working a, a fall job at an apple orchard, and I ran into some college students, and they said, we want to play D&D, and I was like, okay. Well, I can run D&D. So I ran a single session of D&D, but um, it didn't go well. Uh, they never wanted to play again. Uh, apparently, either I didn't do it well or it wasn't what they wanted. I don't know. They never talked to me about it. Uh, but point being is it it got me interested again. I was like, oh, well, no one's playing D&D anymore. They're playing Pathfinder. And Pathfinder from Pathfinder, I got into, oh, well, I was always homebrewing when I was running things anyway. Uh, I got into the third party Pathfinder scene. Started working for a company with a company called Fat Cobble Games. Uh, one day, as a joke, I said to uh, Rick Hershey, the artist slash owner, of Fat Goblin, "If you can get Castle Falcon scene, which is my favorite, if you get the license for that, I will work for you for free." A week later, he says, "I got the license for Castle Falcon scene." I said, "I'm not working for free." <laughs> uh, from there, uh, uh, there were conversations with Mike and Lisa. I met them at Gen Con uh, and Cody. And they uh, they liked the work I did in promoting Falcon Scene online, you know, because uh, I, I didn't get many new players, but I was very vocal about it. And uh, when they essentially uh, the year before they brought Keanu Reeves on stage at E3, uh, the year they showed um, they had showed a big they had showed a, a big trailer that year. Uh, the gameplay. Yeah, uh, orders shot through the roof uh, for 2020 stuff because at the time CDPR was not doing a lot of talking about the world, so the only place you can learn about it was from RTG books. And at that time, uh, RTG handled all their uh, ordering uh, and warehousing and shipping themselves. And so Lisa was, and Cody, they were, and Mike, they were just overwhelmed and they realized they needed an online presence because. Uh, this was a very online phenomenon. And so they said, hey, how about, you know, you come 10 hours a week? And I was like, okay, how about you give me full time? And they said, I don't know if there's enough work for full time. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll start at 10. And then uh, we'll see. And, you know, a month later I was full time because there was enough work for full time. Nice. Cool. And that is how I became the first non Pondsmith employee of RTG since the good old days. Wow. So, were you always into That's cyberpunk or is story it... right there? Right. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, oh, I was just saying that's a that's a heck of a success story for how to get in there. Oh, uh, I, I I fully admit I tripped into it and I and I could not tell people. And people ask me how do I get in the game? I said I don't know. I just <laughs> made stuff and some stuff happened and then suddenly I was here. I don't know how I got here. I mean, I I figured there was ritual sacrifice, uh, bribes. Uh, I, I, Mike likes to tell stories, but no, no, nothing like that. It was, it was just I was in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Um, was I always into cyberpunk? Uh, yes, uh, not to the extent I was into other games. I'll be honest, um, uh, but I always loved the world um, and the genre uh, I, and the satire of it. You know, a lot of people they, they, they're into the guns and the. And the combat and uh, and the chrome and that's cool. But for me, cyberpunk is uh, what does it? William Gibson say the future is uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and it's the same kind of thing. It's like I like being able to take all the crap of the world and turn it up to eleven and make fun of it. At the same time, I make a fun world out of it. Cool. Solid. Um, and then the last okay. question specifically about you uh, is okay. what does what does it mean to be the cyberpunk line manager? Uh, I, I heard cats. That, that's that's it, it, it's, it's um basically uh, you know James and Mike do a lot of the design. Uh, Mike and I and James uh, to a limited extent uh, do a lot of the world lore and stuff. Uh, Mike does the work coordination with CDPR, uh, but my job is to coordinate and organize um, 
to make sure Jay Kovach, um, our art director, gets the art script she needs so she can work with the artists to get the art we need uh, to work with the writers. Um, we had multiple, uh, with Aaron uh, Tarbuck, our managing editor, to work with the freelance writers. He, he, he works directly with the freelancer, with freelance writers and editors, um, but it's uh, based off instruction uh, coming from, from me in terms of what, what we need. Uh, he, 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 they, he's the gateway for them. Uh, and we had, uh, I can't remember how many freelancers. We had several freelancers on Tails. We're gonna have several more on um, Andrew Galdossier. Uh, we'll, that's going to be increasing. There's going to be a lot more out of house writing. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot more coordination. But it's like uh, essentially, I sat down. We decided we're going to make a product. I outline the product. I figure out what's got to be in there. I work with Mike and James on the specifics, system, world, that sort of thing. I work with Aaron in recruiting the right people. And then it's uh, keeping track of things, making sure things hit schedules, uh, managing. Uh, that is the big thing is keeping all the pieces uh, together. Um, it's sort of like, you know, how when you do a jigsaw puzzle and uh, it's got certain things like all the, you take all the sunflower pieces and you put all the sunflower pieces over here and you take all the cloud pieces, you put all the cloud pieces over there. That's my job. And then to put it all together once I've, once I've organized it into piles to put it all together. Sounds fun. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is, and I do a very poor job of explaining it. Um, if I had to write like a, this is my job for the next person, I, that came, the, the person that comes after me, uh, it would be terrible. Uh, I could also say I do what Derek Quintner used to do. Uh, no one will understand what that means, but, you know, Mike does. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, I, I remember seeing his name on, on just about everything. Yeah, it's just uh, it's mostly it's mostly I organize things so that the other people can focus on the things they need to focus on. Got it, Derek. You want to ask a question? Uh, yeah. Um, has have you noticed a uh, a noticeable bump uh, in sales? Since yes. 2077 and Edge Runners came out. Oh yes, um, yes. Uh, there have been several bumps. There was the bump after E3 2019. There was the bump of the year I talked about where I got hired. There was the bump that uh, after Keanu Reeves showed up on stage. Uh, there was the bump around the time the game released. Of course, Bed came out too. So you know, there's core books sell. Um, that's why people put out core books. Uh, they sell better than everything else because that's the one thing you need to play the game, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Edge Runners also a bump of interest in sales. Uh, so yes, uh, the, the the truth of the matter is is that a major media tie-in, and we saw it with Witcher in the television show too. Um, a major media tie-in to your uh, system slash setting uh, that is well received does not guarantee sales. I've known cases where it hasn't. Uh, I've, I've heard of cases in the industry where it hasn't. But it certainly helps quite a bit. So yes, absolutely. So, it has been very nice. And it's nice uh, to all the people who came in to us from Edge Runners or from 2077. Hello and welcome uh, to the tabletop gaming community. <laughs> you survived the experience. Uh, is, uh... Yeah, I got to throw out an old X-Men reference there. Uh, oh, is, uh... Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, obviously most of that is going to be red, but uh, is is like 2020 getting that kind of noticeable bump as well? Um, yes. Uh, since red is a relatively new line uh, without too much source material yet, uh, 2020 books remain very popular in terms of people saying, well, I want to know what Spain is like. I want to know what... Hong Kong is like. I want to know what Wisconsin is like, and so people pick up the 2020 books. Uh, we, I have found that 2020 sales fall into a couple categories. There's the completionists who just want to have everything. They, they, they're, they're cyberpunk collectors. They want all the cyberpunk stuff. Yeah, we wouldn't know anybody the, like that wisdom, would we? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about that. I, and, and I will tell you, 
in the first year, <laughs> the first couple of months of my job, I spent a lot of time on Data Fortress looking at that list of Cyberpunk uh, 2020 and 2013 uh, materials. Uh, it helped me out quite a bit, so thank you for that. Um, my book? I need to update the, that, Yeah, Yeah, there are the um, old gamers who the 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 the, uh, the old 2020 players i don't want to say old old but the 2020 players who had everything and then over time they've lost things they've moved they've you know their basement got flooded whatever it was um and you know now they're getting into it again so they want they need the books again and then there are the new players the people who are coming in from the video game who either want the lore uh sometimes it's just that they want as much lore as they can get and i'll get questions if i want to know about the lore of cyberpunk which books do i need um, and some of them are like, oh, I'm running red and I want to know about, uh, I want to know about Petrochem. And I'll say, oh, you want the court book. No, no, obviously Petrochem in 2045 is different than Petrochem is in 2020, but you can certainly base a lot of it out of that. Or they'll say, I want to, I want to know more about Night City. And I'm like, oh, well, you get the Night City book. And yes, some of the stuff's gone. Some of the stuff, you know, cause cities change in 20 years. Some of the stuff's gone, but you can pick and choose the things you'd like out of it and, you know, get a basic idea of how, how Night City works until such time as there is a Night City book for 2045. Yeah, I mean, that's cyberpunk was always kind of about picking and choosing what works for your game and what doesn't. So, yeah, absolutely. And I tell that to people all the time. Someone will say, what is blah, blah, you know, you know, is it, they'll say, what is, you know, how does X work? And I say X works however it works best for your game. Yeah. You know, um, or the GM, you to, get to decide. To kind of tie into that, uh, is there any any chance we'll get? Like, obviously, red is the is the big thing. Uh, yep. Red is is the new shiny hotness. Uh, but is there any chance that twenty twenty is ever going to get you know any further support? Uh, the old line, probably not. I do. I, I hate saying it. Um, uh, I'm going to say that um, uh, there's been contemplations about uh, reissuing, uh, not just scans, but finding a way to, you know, reset them, make them really nice and shiny again. Uh, and, um, you know, way down the line, possibly a, a essentially a 2020 with red rules or a 2020 setting book. Um, but the 2020 itself I wouldn't say it's impossible, but designing those design the designers who were who did it, except for Mike, have moved on. Um, and uh, there's so much older material in it uh, that it's not something. That being said, like I said, it may be that sometime down the line we'll go, oh wow, you know what? We want to tell a story in 2020, and we'll see what we can do. Awesome. And it won't uh... be like exactly red rules will say well what rules make sense so like for example the fixer rule would change some because of the way availability would work and the nomad rule would probably change a little uh, we would adapt it to the setting period but for right now yes we're working we're, we're focused on red because that's where we are and well you... yeah i mean it's it's the like i said it's the it's the thing and it's it's working yeah. well for you um and you know, for the guys who like the old stuff, there's there's always our websites. <laughs> well, see, and, and and there's the big thing is right now there is so much 2020 material that's still out there, and you know, so we feel that it's there for you if you need it. And yes, absolutely, there is. Go to Data Fortress. There is a lot of cool, <laughs> non-canon but awesome stuff there uh, to keep Thank you, you a much more expanded universe. So, so going forward, we're going to see a lot more of the old 2020 stuff being incorporated into Red? I cannot say that. Um, there is 2020 stuff that has already been incorporated in Red um, in our DLCs. Uh, you'll see some 2020 stuff. You'll see a couple 2020 items uh, coming back for Black Chrome. Uh, for example, Neo-Soviet so uh, Neo Cyber Arms make a comeback. Uh, so do Cyberfingers. Uh, we're excited about that. Um, and of course, we pull on Red on 2020 constantly for lore. For example, um, in Edge Runners Incorporated, there is a character named Brain. Uh, he is a tech. Uh, he kind of looks like a, a bearded, kind of plump Magnum PI. Uh, 
Uh, I love that character. I do. He's a great character. Uh, in 2045, he is in Night City running short circuit with his husband, uh, Three Piece, who is a fixer, and their adopted daughter, Bug. That's, nice. that's awesome. Yes. Uh, we it, It's mentioned very briefly in the Salvaging Night City document. It will come up more in Angel Gal Dossier, because uh, Three Piece is uh, spotlighted there. Um, and we may eventually do a short something sh with short circuit. Um, we're, we're contemplating writing up some in-depth locations for some DLCs down the ride. Uh, and short circuit and Forlorn Hope are high on that list. And of course, Forlorn Hope, Marianne and the Professor are still there running the Forlorn Hope. I mean, obviously, we love that stuff that that uh, campaign book. It's mm. so, it, it's so do, yeah. It's one of the coolest locations that they put out there. I, I like it more than the Afterlife, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, so do I, which is why it is there. It features in two of the Adventures and Tales of the Red. Um, we have oh, new awesome. art of Marianne in there. Uh, of Marianne, Marianne in there, so you can see what she looks like. Uh, her, she won't probably won't let you say she's older than 30. <laughs> but she I mean, a, she's a cool character. It's it's amazing to me how how far ahead Artel Sorian was on the curve with that. She was, yeah. Marianne um, was a transgender protagonist that was never presented as a joke or not protagonist and uh. She, she was a character. character. Yeah, no, she, yeah, yeah, she is. She, she we got she was, you know language wrong, but language evolves. We didn't just know what to say. We, yep. we yeah, yeah, a lot of cases, but yes, Marianne is uh, transgender, uh, male to female. Uh, or assigned male at birth uh, character. Uh, she is married to uh, the professor, who is a uh, Central South American War veteran. Uh, they now own the Forlorn Hope, as opposed to the mysterious man above them who owned it. Uh, they owned it outright, and they're surrounding it. And as his point, as has been mentioned, not even Rogue messes with them. So dollar bills going? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the one thing is this. 20 years later, after a major God rest war, his soul. some people had vanished. <laughs> I, don't, I can't tell you whether he's dead or not, oh. honestly, because we haven't decided. But we did decide that the face of the bar owns the bar. Got it. That that That's all <clears throat> intriguing to me. I can't yeah. I can't wait to see more come about that. Yeah, also also the top floor of the bar is gone. No. Oh. Yeah, it, it, during... Uh, during during the fourth corporate war, there was a point where, because uh, Militech used it as a recruiting station, if you recall, there was a Militech recruiter who actively worked in the Forlorn Hope. I, I do remember that. Um, Arasaka attacked it at one point, and of course, the edge runners who hang out there came to its defense. But during the battle, a stray rocket took out the fourth floor. So as it was rebuilt, they just put the roof over the third floor. Um, the, the other question, and this is a question that we got from the community, um, what do you see as the biggest improvements and what is the biggest drawback, uh, that you see over 20 or over red over 2020? Like hmm. what rules do you think are stellar and what rules do you think kind of miss the mark a little? Um, See, that's the thing. Uh, rules are a, fla are, are, are a matter of taste for the most part. I think where Red uh, hopefully excels is it doesn't have 20 source books worth of material layered on top of each other yet. Um, and as a result, uh, there are not uh, these strange mismatches of things that don't quite work together. Like, for example, um, 2020 in its ace level as a street level gang. You know where you're these punks living on this working in, in the streets of night city and then a few books later uh, you have uh full body conversions and ap acs and these massive guns that are you know paramilitary campaign levels uh and so and i don't think 2020 did as good a job as it could have in uh showing those power levels so that it's not that you can't have different campaign styles in 2020 because you can't you can have street level campaign and the global merc campaign the firestorm campaign right but i don't think 2020 did a good job of saying hey game master just because this gun is in a book doesn't mean your players have to be able to buy it yeah <laughs> yeah um, that's 
<laughs> that that misconception really came up a lot back yeah, in the also, day. Also, also getting rid of armor layering, I think uh, helps a lot. Um, as you know, you got to the point. Every twenty twenty player gets to that point where oh. I've, I, I've mastered the art of armor layering, and therefore I can walk through uh, a minefield. Nothing will happen to me. Uh, so I think that's it. Uh, where it misses the mark, uh, I'm not going to say. Uh, I'm going to say that obviously I understand people who prefer the heavier lethality. I, I like to say red's cooler because the critical injury system, I think, is nastier in a way. But I understand the, you know, Eight boxes, you're gone. Uh, you know that's fun. There, there's a there's a visceral joy to that, um, which uh, I I will happily say if that is your thing, 2020 is a better game for you at that point. Or, you know, you can try uh, doing a, a homebrew pluge of the two. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's one thing I do like um, is the streamlining of combat within Red. Uh, mm -hmm. However, oftentimes. At least in the past, before Red, right? Whenever I attempted to do any type of critical injury to a particular player, whether it was in D&D, &D, Cyberpunk, or, or something like, hey, you lost an eye or you lost a limb, I've had a lot of pushback on players who were like, you just ruined my character. And it's like, no, I just gave you a cool scar that your character can talk about. And now you have an excuse yeah. to be groovy cybernetics. I mean, but and, and that's that's something we do in red too. Is uh, you have options there, right? You can get that cyber arm with the grenade launcher. You can get the medical grade cyber cybernetics. You can get a clone arm put back on your on your body. Um, it, your arm being gone uh, is not the end of things. Uh, it's not ruining your character. It's just you know now you've got to go do that instead of working for yeah. a week or. Or healing, you know, or, or building something in your workshop, or uh, doing the thing, other cool things you want to do during downtime. But uh, you, you know, what you're highlighting is the importance of the session zero, where you lay things out and say, "Hey, this is a game where you can lose an arm, or an eye, or yep. you know, a spleen." Life is cheap. You can Life either get cheap. on board with that or find a different game. Well, yeah. so someone, so someone asked me the other day, he said, "Why aren't there robots everywhere in Cyberpunk?" And I said, "Because human beings are cheaper than robots." Yep. You, know, you have to build and maintain a robot. If a human dies, you just go get another one. There is a there is a line around the mega complex of dudes yeah. looking for deep work. Yeah, exactly. And and I actually deal with that on a day to day basis, where it's like, hey, you can pay a developer X amount of dollars to program something automatically, or you can hire, you know. A bunch of other people in, in different countries to do it a hell of a lot cheaper than it would cost to automate it, right? Yeah, and and the, and the and the thing is, is in, in the cyberpunk setting, uh, Night City and the United States in general is those other countries. Yes. Uh, yeah, quite literally. Um, um. So the next question we have is. Is there any thought towards bringing any of the old school artists or writers back into the fold, or have they moved on to bigger and better things? Yes. Um, we, you know, uh, uh, we have Dave Ackerman doing some writing for us. Uh, he has he worked on Red. He's still uh, active with the company. Uh, there might be some other writers down the, down the line who will join us. Um, a lot of them they've moved on. You know, they're busy doing other things. They they they're living their lives. Um, same thing with some of the, the artists. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is a lot of those old art styles don't necessarily work with uh, the way Red's art styles work. Um, uh, it's an unfortunate part of the transition from uh, these uh, black and white, very gorgeous black and white uh, line art pieces to the more modern day, but uh, there's some cool stuff like uh, i would love to get sam Liu to come in and do a piece for something you know uh if he can get time from his very busy schedule making dc animated movies <laughs> i uh, mean sam's not the only one who went on to great sets. you guys also had paolo parente working with you yeah uh, paolo, and... i mean we have um and so yes uh but right now uh we've got some really great artists uh from around the world that Jay Kovach, our, our director, works with. 
um, who do some amazing things. Uh, every time Bad Moon Studios, for example, uh, turns in a piece, uh, they did the corporate, what we call the corporate Last Supper, and the cor- in the Red Book, which is a f- uh, two-page spread of I love that piece. Uh, heads of various mega corps, all in a news conference. Um, and that was just such an amazing piece. Uh, and they, every once in a while, they'll, they'll just turn something up and be like, oh my god, they turned it in so fast, it's so beautiful. Um, and uh, we're really excited about it. I, I'm so excited for people to see the art in black chrome because uh, oh, yeah. almost almost everything in it <laughs> is represented in art. Um, Drooling in anticipation. Almost uh, everything in it is represented in art. Full, full, th- uh, full color art. Uh, these gorgeous, you know, you could put them right in the video game guns and these beautiful could be on a billboard vehicles. Um, even even the icons, There's there will be apps for your agent in Black Chrome and the icons are, are in there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Plus, um, uh, we have uh, uh, six fixers and their night markets. So every night market will have a map a full 11 by 17 map of the night market as well as um an illustration of the fixer and with the uh, standing against the background of their night market so you have a a concept of what it feels like cool yeah the art is is so very important and anytime anybody <coughs> asks me what i think about red the first words out of my mouth are like the art is just so bloody gorgeous yeah. um we're lucky I, Jay really knows how to work with artists. The, uh, I mean, the art was what originally before when I was first introduced to cyberpunk, I didn't even, I was unfamiliar with the, uh, with the genre, with what the word cyberpunk meant, but the art just sucked me in. And, um, particularly the works of, uh, Chris Hawk about and, uh, Mike Jackson. Yes. Um, like their, their, their works, just i would love to I, I love the full color of the modern art but i just their designs were so iconic yeah no there's there there are some um what, what the, the one piece and i'm blanking on who did it right now but it's the one piece of the man uh looking down at his disassembled cyber arm uh, and he doesn't look like a puff hard net uh, cyberpunk right he looks like a normal dude he's just looking at his looking at his cyber arm as he's like servicing it you know yeah, core book. Regular uh, from the second edition of the core book yes I, I that is that's one of my favorite pieces out of all the old cyberpunk stuff um because it's and i like that uh, you see that it's, it's a bit red this that's just like this it's not you know super actiony it's just here's this guy in this world and you know these are people they live here I like it when they live there. Yes. Yeah, I want to say that was Jackson. Um, I could be wrong, but I'm... Yeah. Yes. It may be. that the, Part of the problem is with, uh, with that is um, I, had, I had a lot of trouble. Uh, we did 12 days of gun miss last December, and we used all the original art to create um, like wireframe things. And we had to credit the artists, of course, because we credit artists. And I had to code it. Dave Ackerman, and I said, I think I figured out who did these pieces. But do you know who did these pieces? There's a list of artists in the book. Uh, you know, we 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 don't have them sign. They didn't sign their pieces. You know, we even if they did, the signature was probably whited out because uh, it's uh, format. You know, just the way it is. And for and he he was like, yeah, I think this was this person. This was this person. So I go, thank you. I'm glad you remember. So, so speaking yeah. about the the writers yeah. and contributors, um, yes. I think there's a lot of community members who are creating the various homebrew stuff. How does people? How do people get noticed by Altar Sorian to become a freelancer or, or have the ability to do any collaboration with the company? Oh, you know that's tough. I want to I want to say you know don't give up. You do stuff, we'll notice you, um, and sometimes we do. Uh, but the truth is, is a lot of times I don't look at homebrew. Uh, we don't look at homebrew for legal reasons, um, you know, uh, because if we, it's a, one of those things we know if we come up with something similar, that's that's just parallel evolution. 
parallel development that happens. Uh, so that that's the case. But, um, but yeah, uh, keep working, do things. Uh, sometimes uh, we had several, several writers, Witcher, for example, uh, they start off as, you know, they're out there, they're running games, they're, they're talking about things, uh, and we, they get noticed. It's not going to happen often. The, the truth is because um, there's only so many writers we ha have at a time working on any one project. Uh, um, and sometimes it's a mixture of older and newer, but a lot of the writers on Tales uh, start off with uh, different things. Um, let's see, Tales we had uh, Trace Wilson, uh, because he helped us create Trace Santiago. So we asked him to write. Um, we had um, Melissa Wong. Melissa Wong uh, did two adventures in Tales. Uh, she just really started putting out um, what she calls 20 things lists. She's 20, 20 things in Night City, you know, on, on some bizarre topic. And she was just so evocative and flavorful in her writing. And part of that comes from the fact that she is, um, she grew up in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Which, you know, is a place where there are street markets and night markets of various kinds. Um, and it's a lot of people adapting technology as opposed to just buying technology. Uh, and that shows in her writing. And they're like, oh, well, that's great. So we started here. We bought the writing for the 20 things list. So we put it in the data pack. And we said, hey, can you do an adventure? And did it too. And it was great. Um, so it is possible. Um, but it's a case of don't. We don't take submissions. Do your stuff. Don't do your stuff to get noticed. No, don't do your stuff and say, "Hey, I hope Artel Zorian sees this." Hey, Artel Zorian, take a look at this. Um, <laughs> just do your stuff, and sometimes you'll get noticed. And I can't promise when or where, but some people will. Cool. Um, so let's go into actually uh, future state for. Artalsorian. So, <clears throat> okay. I know the world is currently in a bit of a chaos. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that, and... we, we've learned many things. As weird as it sounds, people used to when we first put out Cyberpunk Red and we started really talking about it. People were like, "Oh, I don't understand how this economy works." <laughs> and and now I was like, "Say, you know how you can't get a PlayStation Five? Though you can actually now because like the local GameStop has them." But I was like, "You know how you could get you know toilet paper or the PlayStation Five?" They said, "Yeah." I said, "That's that." Economy's that, but everything. Yeah. Well, even um, with Kickstarters, right? I mean, there's so many Kickstarters have been delayed by the past two years. Um, even yeah, but though... we don't. Yeah. We don't print uh, overseas generally. Uh, we try to print on the continent, but even then, uh, Amazon's bought all the cardboard and paper. Right. So you know, printers are saying, "We'll go to printer and say we want you know." <clears throat> This many I, books, this many pages, this kind of paper. And I say, we can't give you that. We can give you this kind of paper because that's the only paper we have. And we're like, okay. I, had, you know, I had never, I had never put those two to two and two together. But yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, and it's in itself so very cyberpunk. I, I mean, it's yeah, it's very cyberpunk that nobody can get paper products because Amazon bought all that shit up. Yeah, but, but it used to be like it was like you know printer and paper but now like they'll they'll buy the paper on spec because they just want to make sure they have the paper in plenty of time because that print on demand service they run you know or you know the um or all those boxes your stuff comes in yeah yeah so do you see a so, light yes. at the end of the tunnel That's... or is it still because i know there's a now a than... tree shortage yeah. coming up or yeah, it's, it's currently lot, affecting it's a lot better than it was yeah there are shortages, and, and, you know we'll see if there's a rail strike or not um it's a lot better than it was. It is still not as good as it was before it was bad. Um, printers are now booking out space on their presses where they would do it for months are now doing it for years. Um, we are probably not going to be that. The second delay is that much. We can find spaces, but um, it's a lot harder now than it used to. It used to be you could just go to a printer and say, I need this book, and then they say, fine. Now it's they'll say, here are your windows. Can you get us the book by the files by then? Got it. Um, um, so I remember back in January you listed four products. You've delivered one. Um, so Tales. we're still waiting on Danger Girl dossier, the uh, Black Chrome and Rogue Street uh, Weapons. Yes, um, Black Chrome. 
is in final art stages. As I have mentioned, every Interview. nearly every <laughs> item has artistic it ha has a, a artistic representation. And I can say every item has its own pieces because there's some that are in compilation pieces. Like the fashion will be spreads. Um, but there's multiple pieces of fashion in a single spread. Uh, but everything, almost everything, and there's some internal cyberware we're not showing because it's inside your body. Uh, and that doesn't work as that is ironically where black and white illustration actually works a lot better than art than color illustration for the most part. Um, yeah. But, uh, we are only showing it. We'll only be showing external cyberware in this case, uh, in this particular book. Um, but uh, almost every piece, and there's like 140, 150 items in this book. Wow. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's a lot of vehicles, a lot of weapons. And it's a case of you can't. In some some cases, we'll commission the art as we're writing. Your uh, porn you know, making a return, right? Uh, but with uh, with weapons or vehicles, you have to make sure the writing is done. Because if we say X has you know has a magazine that carries 300 rounds, I'm not saying there's a gun with 300 rounds. I'm just saying as an example, as a, as a gun with 300, it, it has a 300. 300 rounds is belt, belt fed you know it's got a sniper rifle on top and then we send it to the artist and then in the middle of that we go oh no, we have three guns that are belt fed with a sniper rifle on top and so we need something we need at least one of these guns to occupy a different design space and then they send us back this art we have to start all over again so uh, it took a while uh, but the art is in its finishing stages uh, it will not come out this year. Uh, obviously, uh, it takes time to print, uh, but we are definitely hoping for early next year with Black Chrome. Andrew Galdassier uh, will be later, sometime later next year, probably. That is a book of NPCs uh, with like 15 different groups or factions represented, and these range for everywhere from very big, like Maelstrom. So you'll have a bunch of different Maelstrom members to very small, like one specific edge runner group. But so it's like, like the, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was. That's the comparison I was going to make. Is yeah, it's, a, it's like, it like the edge, red runners versus incorporated. edge runners. Yeah, um, but instead of being just a bunch of edge runners you can hire or work with, uh, it is a bunch of different factions in Night City, and they range from mooks all the way up to uh, there's a only a couple of hardened bosses in this book, uh, but uh, because they should be relatively rare, um, one of them is a Maelstrom member. And they are nasty, uh, but uh, there there will be different levels. Like, so if you're running a Maelstrom encounter, you could run with these specific characters, or you could just say, "I need Maelstrom mooks. I'll give them all these stats of these mooks that I have." And, you know, I'll give them different names, but at least then I have some Maelstrom mooks who feel like Maelstrom mooks, and not like mooks who happen to be named Maelstrom. Um, so there's gonna be 15 factions: Maelstrom, Tiger Claws, NCPD, the Maldicados, uh, some danger gals, of course, all designed as a dossier of interesting people of interest to the company, uh, given uh, compiled by danger gal operatives because that's an intelligence corporation. There will also be a section on uh, how to make your NPCs, and for the most part, all the NPCs in this book will follow those rules. The NPCs you make at home will be detailed. Here's how I make NPC creations on each of the eight levels, from MOOC up to Harden Boss. And then there there might be some other stuff in there. Uh, for now, that's that's the main, main part. There might be maybe the, maybe an adventure. Who knows? Cool. Um, and then Rogue Street Weapons um, is working on that. Uh, Black Chrome has put that behind because Rogue Street Weapons will be a deck of cards, which will have oh. weapons on it. The first deck. Uh, this may be a multi-deck product. The first deck uh, would be uh, the various weapons in the core rulebook, as well as ammunition and attachments. And uh, weapons for the DLCs, I think we're planning on going up through Gunmiss. So Gunmiss, um, the combat umbrella from Weather, and the Hyperburst Microcutie from the pin set. And these will be all in cards so that, you know, uh, easy to see. Uh, you know, here's my card. Here's my weapon. Here is the stats. Here's its range table on it. 
Um, but the thing is, is we also wanted to make match. We want to do art for all these weapons, and to do art for all these weapons, uh, we need to first free up the artist working on black foam. Got it. Um, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, we are working on that. Plus, uh, you okay, Derek? Is, yeah. Why? What happened? Oh, I, I heard you're, you're like shuffling. Like your microphone's yeah. rubbing against something. Oh, I'm sorry. That's cool. All right. So yes, yeah, so we're working on those. Um, we're not ready to announce anything beyond those yet, except for Interface Red Two, um, which will collect, I think, everything through the end of last year. All the all the PDFs, DLCs, from through most of them. Uh, I think a few of them, will, one or two, will be left out for various reasons. Through the end of last year, uh, we're going to move to them being Interface Red being a print-on-demand annual, where it will be all the DLC for a year, plus at least one bonus article. And you'll be able to buy it print on demand. Cool. On drive through RPG. I, I very much like that concept. That's. Yeah. So, and so the, uh, the bonus article, the bonus article will be uh, a return of a 2020 favorite. So it's not full body conversions. I'll let you know, but it isn't something cool. One quest, or one question, and it might be a spoiler. Um, okay. So this is going back, and as you know, I. I played in Mike's game over in, at TotalCon. Um, yeah. And he would talk about Black Chrome, and this was back back in 2013, 2014. Um, okay, I will say projects evolve. I'm sure. He wrote that yeah. every time. So he, he brought up one piece of cyberware that he was very excited about, which was basically a shredder that was installed in a person's chest. So you would kind of do a bear hug, and they would just get ground to ribbons. Is that something that's Ooh. still there, or is it... Uh... Oh, that, that unfortunately, I, I can tell you that did not make it, unfortunately. But that's cool. I might save that for Rusted Chrome. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Cr Black Chrome evolved a lot, uh, because uh, the way the... Pro it had a very long project life, and it evolved a lot over time. And it's very cool. And, and as Mike says in his classes, when he's talking, and his lectures, when he's talking about design, the first thing you do, you gotta be ready to do in any game, is to kill your baby. And for whatever reason, that did not make it. A, by the time I was involved in the project, that was no longer there. Got it. So I'm, I'm afraid the, the bear hug, <laughs> the bear hug shredder is not in there. But it is a cool idea. Yes, he he was he very excited at the time talking about it at the, during the game. We we're like, yeah. damn, that's going to be heinous. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I, I imagine you grapple, and every round you could do. Be actually like choke, I suppose. You have around you can do X amount of damage. Yeah. Like you're hitting with a heavy melee weapon, very heavy melee weapon, I suppose. I'm just picturing the Godzilla monster Deegan with the giant rotating buzzsaw on his chest. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, but you just mentioned something interesting, which was rusted chrome. What's yes, going on uh, with that? In theory, in theory, the next Chrome book would be rusted chrome, and it would be. Uh, less urban focused. There are actually a fair amount of non-urban things in Black Chrome, uh, but this would be more focused. I cannot promise when or if uh, things evolve. Uh, Rusted Chrome is in plan. It is a is a tentative plan now. But it may be that we get a little closer and say, "Oh, you know what? We want to do. We want to do, um, you know, shiny Chrome or deep blue Chrome instead." You know, uh, and so that that may change. Uh, but right now, the plan is if we do another Chrome book, it will be called Rusted Chrome. And it'll have a lot more outside of Night City and into the Badlands focus. Okay. I mean, I got to admit, it, the name alone, like it, 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 anybody who listens to the show knows my love for nomads and yeah, the whole no, Rusted a... Chrome visual image that that brings up is just. It, it's hmm, a very cool it. idea, and things happen. Um, uh, sometimes things. Uh, all out. Sometimes projects get absorbed into other projects. Um, sometimes, you know, you decide to split projects up. Um, a lot of what's in the data pack was originally going to be included with a data screen, for example. But we decided that uh, they worked better as two different products um, in terms of pricing and packaging. Uh, so that happens. Um, a character from Danger Gal dossier, uh, one of the fixers, was removed from Danger Girl dossier because they worked better in Black Chrome. Uh, so that kind of happens. Um, 
I think an item or two left black chrome to go into the DLCs. Uh, so sometimes that just that, that happens. So I'm not promising rusted chrome absolutely is you know going to happen, but right now there's a there's a it, it, it's 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 solidly in the conceptual stage. Right. I know we only have five minutes left, so I think this is I, probably I can gonna... go a little over. Okay. So we'll, if we'll you see. Know, that's fine. Um, yep. There's there's a bunch more questions, but they're more uh, more I, towards. I, I'll tell you what I. I, I can give you to 8.30. Okay. Well, well, we'll see what we can do then. <laughs> okay. Um, so there was also mention from Mike about a, a high rider supplement. Yeah. Is oh, that still in the, the works? So much. Um, Mike is excited about the high riders. Mike is excited about doing some Afrofuturism stuff. That's, um, yeah. Uh, so the answer is, the answer is, okay. So Mike will say things, and they are these concepts that are in his head. Mike is, an, Mike is a dreamer. He's a Walt Disney. Yep. Um, and that's not to say that they will not happen. It's just that he will think years ahead of himself. Um, and say, you know, I want to do this. It could be that down the line we do, for example, we do, we do, um, we do uh, 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 cold chrome. And that is a combination, you know, high rider slash high rider gear book. Or it may be that we do a full <laughs> Africa we may do a full Africa we may explore it through uh, a different means. So the answer is absolutely. We want to do more with the high riders. We do. Um, will it be deep space too? Probably not. Will it be something? And will that something be something else? Cause you know, publishing is different. It used to be that you can put out these 150 page books, black and white books, soft covers. And now the way games work is they tend to be a little chunkier, full color, you know? Uh, so that it's a bit different. Um, uh, so yes, yeah. we will explore the high riders. How exactly we will, I cannot say at this point. But yes, uh, the high riders. I know one of the biggest things Mike and Patrick, uh, his uh, main point of contact over at CDPR, have worked on is how space has evolved between 2045 and 2077, because that is unseen but amazingly important to the setting. Nice. Yeah, I just you don't you don't see it in Night City, but every it's everything from those cool uh, Kendachi katana you're carrying to how goods flow to and for to um you know that great depending on which ending you got ending of you floating spoilers for 2077 <laughs> space heading towards a certain iconic place. Yeah, and the the whole Phantom Liberty and how that's gonna fold into that whole I, thing is I don't know what you're talking about, man. I can't talk <laughs> I, I have no idea what you... Phantom what? Phantom Liberty. Yeah. Hey, you, you can acknowledge that Phantom Liberty is I, coming I out. Can, I can acknowledge <laughs> that Phantom Liberty exists. Um, that's all I can acknowledge. And it's coming out sometime it. next year. Don't know exactly I when, can, but... I, I, can acknowledge that it, I can acknowledge that it exists. It's going to come out. I cannot acknowledge anything else about it. Right. Yeah, because... Um, well, speaking of high riders, right? I just started up a campaign with um, a high rider campaign, specifically during the Fourth Corporate War, in which when the O'Neill mm. station yeah. has the revolt with Galileo. So, the seven minute war and yep. the seven, nine minute war, seven minute war, the, the, seven the, hour the, war. Yeah, and, and and well, there was also the um, the space battle where the, the the Russians and the U.S. battleships, spaceships. Open up on each other for yes. reasons that they still don't understand because someone was hacking them. Yeah. Um, and all the and, and, all, and half and half and half the satellite communication network in the world was destroyed. Yeah, or I mean, more than half, actually. It's so, yeah. it's definitely an interesting time period, especially when you look at space and how it was. Like one of the O'Neills is a joint venture between the USA and Japan. Yeah, and how the hell did <laughs> that did that O'Neill survive without any major well, conflicts? Well, but. And, and that's the interesting thing is because you know it wasn't a war between Japan and the United States. They actually got along fairly well. Um, yes. In the end, Crescent, the Japanese government, were able to say, "Hey," the Japanese were like, "No, this isn't us. This is not us." And the Americans were like, "Yeah, not us." Any, anyway, and they <laughs> both bought their respective uh, wayward sons to heal. Yes. So that's that's going to play interesting into into the campaign on how that whole whole thing works yeah. 
but that sounds great i like the high riders um I, I love a good street level campaign my go-to is a good street level campaign you know but um a street level crystal palace campaign you know with people living in the back quarters a or if you will a lower decks campaign yes um, <laughs> it's a lot of it sounds like a lot of fun yes um but back to the, the to the subject of uh future projects um, what are the plans for a 2077 supplement, or is that something that's still being worked out between CDPR and you guys? Gonna make one and say when. <laughs> that that that's the entirety. We, we're going to make one. It is not going to be. It is going to be a supplement and not a core rulebook. Probably everything I say is subject to change. Um, it, you know, we don't want to do the thing where you know every era is its own game. Uh, its own full game because uh, you know, then you're shelling out 80, 60, 80 bucks per book to play essentially the same game in different time periods or different parts of the galaxy. I mean, um, fantasy flight. honestly, I think most of, most of our listeners were just looking for that validation that it's still no, coming in the pipeline. Yeah, no, no, 2077, 20, 2077. In, in his spare time, James does rule design for 2077. Uh, so it's something we all want. Um, I obsessively. Uh, uh, in in working, there's a lot of cases. I will say this: um, 2077 and 2020 are always on our mind as we're making new things and new lore. There will be a 2077 character in Danger Gal dossier. That's awesome. I mean, it's got to be it's it's got to be weird writing that the current system that you're writing for a current system that's sandwiched between these two, like extremely uh, like well-known properties at this point. It is, but at the same time, it's great because I can pull from so many different sources. Or we can pull from so many different sources. If I can go there and I can say, hey, who's running Sword Circuit? Oh, you know what? You know this character who got one page ever in all the 2020 lore that I really like? I just love the art design of the character. He is, you know? That's um, and I can say, I can say, And I can say, hey, you know what? This character that I have art for, that would be great if it was this 2077 character way back in the day. Or it's like, huh, you know what? You know, we're saying they're building mega buildings in Watson, but if you look at the mega buildings on the map in 2077, they're not the, the, the ones that are the, the ones in Watson are like 10 and 11 or 12. You know, they're they're way up there. It's like so obviously we get to come up with a story as to why they were built out of order. You know? Yeah. Um, what happened is, to the missing ones and? Well, I mean, they're all they're all there, but the, you know, it, it, the answer is most likely the corporations. You know, the, the rich people didn't want poor people living in their backyard. Um, same, really? Same thing that happened. The same thing that happens what, to. What, uh, what world happens was that? To, <laughs> yeah, same, same thing that happens to uh, to uh, water treatment plants and prisons and um, solar farms. You know, and windmills. If you, people with money say not there, and it gets built in poor areas. Um, but. Uh, no, uh, there is so much cool stuff, and um, uh, I, you know, a lot of people their their introduction to the idea of multiple dimensions came from Planescape or something similar to the Manual of the Planes in D and D. Mine was from Crisis of Infinite Earths, and so I love continuity and just figuring it all out and working out timelines. Um, it is you, like, you both. it is so much fun to sit there and say, okay. What obscure thing from 2020 can I bring forward? You know, and they're, they're here and there. They're sprinkled here and there. I said, what, you know, what really cool thing from 2077 can I bring back? And how did something from 2020? This is one of the reasons why Mike wanted to write 2045 so bad, uh, read so bad, is because he wanted to tell the story of how it got from here to there. How did you get from, um, uh, the you know. Ray, Ray Bartmoss flying through Tron space in 2020 to the quick hacking people at a construction site in 2077. There is a story. There is a reason why that happened in the way it did. Um, yes, some of it's for mechanical, you know, mechanical purposes, but that's fine. There's still a game. The purpose of lore is to back up the mechanics. The purpose of mechanics is to back up the lore. They work together. Uh, yeah, I love the lore of of the universe. Like, not necessarily so much the character lore as in 
as as much as I love just the overall world building. It just instant appeal. Well, it's um, you know, we like to say Night City is the biggest character in Cyberpunk. Yeah, I would agree to that. You know, and if 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 you're not telling if you're telling a story about Night City and Night City's not a character in it, you've done something wrong. One hundred percent. Yeah, that's that's that was we had a lot of fun in um, Tales of the Red, with uh, coming up with you know the the virtuality bar, where you can go in, and you I... you pay for your um, called delirium, you pay for your essentially your virtual overlay, your AR overlay, whether everyone's gonna be a zombie or everyone's gonna be like um, a pirate, uh, that was a lot of fun. My favorite. My favorite thing about Red and 2077, for that matter, as far as lore, is uh, like 2020 almost, it, it just from the from the timeline of events, it, it happened too quickly. Uh, it happened but in with, three with, years, yeah. Yeah, with, with, with Red, like suddenly all these items, all these bits of tech have legacy. Like, you'll come across a dude with like a fourth generation cyber limb that's held on by rubber bands and duct tape yeah um and i that just appeals to me yeah i, I enjoy there's a piece of art um it's actually to make it into the horrible book we may use it for something else someday uh but this guy's got this blocky cyber arm and to me it looks like at some point some tech adapted a industrial robot arm you know the the, the, the arms you see in car factories yeah into being a cyber arm and I'm like you know that's cool that i would very cool. much love to see more of that well that's yeah. the and big soul via uh arms isn't it or what was it's it? very similar yeah to the to the, the looks like it was made out of tractor park soviet neo-soviet arms jury rigged cyberware <laughs> yeah and and it's like um and a lot of that is you know what's more punk than you know instead of buying it from some megacorp getting you know your local tech to make it for you. Okay. I mean, that's the core of it right there. Stick it, stick it you know, doing it in the community rather than in, uh, in the system. So, because we're talking but, about sorry, 20... So we're talking about 2077. Um, yes. And I've seen a bunch of people comment and really have, like, a, a little bit of a debate on, on the, the specifics around Cyberpunk 2077, CDPR... Um, and there was an article um, from Ada, Adam um, Kaczynski. Kaczynski, Kaczynski, yes. <laughs> he <laughs> mentioned um, that basically CDPR owns Cyberpunk. Um, I think it was an oversimplistic of of what he said, but you know, in the quote he said, "In the case of Cyberpunk, the entire franchise is ours." Um, but I think that the concept of what trademark is versus copyright and, and what is that all licensing does, um, there's been a bit of a bit of the community that just doesn't understand exactly who owns what. Um, it, it, IP law is complex, especially when it's international IP law. Yep. Um, so yes, uh, they own the trademark on cyberpunk franchise uh essentially they own the right to using that name for the purposes of making specific products as registered in the trademark in the multiple trademark filings which you can find um, i encourage everyone to learn how to use the government trademark database uh, it is a great way to keep an eye on what corporations are doing um, and it's very it's very fascinating at the same time you go to uh you look up trademark database uh, go make sure you're going to the government one. It'll end with .gov. Uh, you can enter in uh, specific search terms, and it will lead you back. And, and trademarks are specific. So, for example, um, it may be for a game, which does not mean somebody cannot make a plumbing supply with the same name. Right. You know. Uh, so that's how trademarks work. Uh, we, uh, as far as I know, still own the copyright on everything we've ever written. Uh, has a franchise uh, CDPR uh, does uh, basically yes uh, basically uh, have control over you know they can make the comics and the books and the board games and the statues and the posters and then we have 2020 in red 
Um, and we can make miniatures and dice and other cool things, which may be coming out in the future. Art, like the net running deck. Yeah. So it is, it's kind of joint in how it works. Um, but uh, it, it, it is not a case of what they're saying. What he is saying in that purpose is not a case of, oh, in the end, if, um, you know, Skapkowski, the writer of the Witcher books, which is what he was really referring to, I think, yep. at some point, wants to make a TV series, which he did, he can, and it has nothing to do with us. We get no benefit from that other than the fact that our games sell out again because people uh, want, you know, want more Witcher. Um, so in that case, yes, we're not about to go to, you know, he's not, they're not about to, we're not about to go to another video game company and say, hey, do you want to make a Cyberpunk video game? And they're, you know, and, you know they're not going to have to worry about um, us, you know, in that case, you know, saying, oh, Netflix, make a Cyberpunk show. Right. Uh, anything like that would involve them. Um, and it's a joint collaboration in the creation of the universe. Yeah. And, and I remember actually on YouTube, um, I think it was first Full Sail, where Mike Pondsmith talked about IP and how you maintain IP for your world, right? Um, yep. And, and the various licensing for it. It's a very interesting conversation that he has. Yeah. Um, and I definitely want all the listeners to go check it out. Um, just do a look for Mike Pondsmith Full Sail, I think, was you probably can find it on YouTube. But yeah, yeah I, I, I know Mike is, is very smart on that topic. Um, yeah, well, it, it's, it's important. Um, it's easy to lose control of your IP. It's easy to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, these days, uh, some people are lucky. You have your your your, your George R. R. Martins, you have your um, Robert Kirkman's, um, but at the same time, you have like um, uh, you have people who you know uh, the um, guy who wrote the Last Unicorn, and I think you know it took a long time for him to get anything out of the movie, you know. Um, so it's tough, and and it's incredibly complex, and there's a reason why you have lawyers for it. We have a lawyer that handles our IP issues uh, and our licensing issues, um, and uh, there's a reason for that because it is not only complex within the United States, but when you're attacking about other countries too, it gets even more complex. Okay, so I mean, the... speaking of Go ahead. speaking of the franchise IP and Artel Sorian. Um, how much how much uh collaboration is mike still uh providing with the various franchise offerings like you know obviously there's the video game which he collaborated heavily on but it, how much input does he have on say edge runner or the comics um not as much there um uh, because that's that's it, you know it's based off of collaboration he does so what mike does with CDPR at this point, and it may change in the future. But at this point, is mostly what he does is world building. He will sit down and talk about here is how X happened, here is how Y happened, here is what this city is like, here is what, um, here is how space travel works, here is you know, uh, and he and he and CDPR will work on that. And then those concepts, he does not need to go over comics or even Edge Runners. Um, because uh, that is, and and so, uh, in Edge Runners, uh, you get, we got to see it early. That was cool. We got to see it in February. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, but uh, no, he does not. You know, it's not day to day. It's, it's he, when you have a partner you can trust with things. You don't need to micromanage everything they do. Okay. I mean, it's got to be such a just such a dream come true. I remember. Uh, I remember lamenting back in the 90s that, you know, Cyberpunk is this amazing property, but it seemed like Shadowrun was, was, Shadow was, Run was getting the, getting the video games and all the money. Yeah. And I, now... I, I, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say the dream back in the day was, you know, there were so many anime influences and comic influences and video game influences in the 2020 line already to, to see it get all those things. It's it's really a dream come true for everybody who was even remotely a fan. Yeah, but wisdom I can follow up with that is okay. So Shadowrun was run by FASA. Where's FASA today? 
True it's, enough. <laughs> for, it, well, uh, it depends on. Uh, there is a FASA. They are publishing Earth Dawn. Uh, it's a very. They're doing some very cool stuff with it. Uh, there is. FASA uh, still about? I thought they folded. There is yeah. a FASA. It's a. Oh. It's a different FASA with a FASA name. Got uh, it. Is, technically speaking, it's. It is run by Ross Babcock, who was one of the co-founders of FASA, the original FASA. Um, they are producing Earth Dawn and a couple other games. I think they may have just gotten. Um, Renegade Legion, maybe, um, and then you've got you know Shadowrun, uh, which is over with Tops. Um, yeah, through so yeah, Jordan uh, Jordan Weiss, I think is. Yeah. The other co-founder um, of FASA. Uh, yeah, so uh, but uh, I had a very interesting moment the other day. Where and you're right, uh, back in the day, Shadowrun had a really cool video game on the Sega Genesis. Shadowrun was a game people played, and everyone knew who Doc Wagon was. Yeah. Um, and then the other day, we have a statue of two trauma team uh, operators, the ones from the comic, trauma team comic mm -hmm. series. We have a statue of them, which we display in our booth whenever we do a convention. And someone's coming up to them, and we're talking, I'm talking to them about it. And I said, and they said, and I said yeah, they, 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 they we're talking about trauma team. And I said, yeah, it's sort of like dog wagon. They had no idea what a dog wagon was. <laughs> they knew what a trauma team was, though. Yeah. No, that it's it's, said, it's fantastic to see you guys finally come out on top. You're always on top in my book, though. That that being said, uh, we hope people enjoy playing Shadowrun. If you enjoy playing Shadowrun, great. If you want to grab our stuff and convert it to Shadowrun, by all means, we're happy to have you do it. Um, so, you know, so plenty speak... of people did that back in the day with Chromebooks. I mean, uh, it was always a two-way street, or uh, uh, back and forth. Like, I, I've grabbed more than enough stuff from Shadowrun myself. Yep, so. sorry. Go ahead, Smiley. Yeah, so to follow up on that whole com conversation about the IP and, and, and what you can do with it, um, is there any plans for doing any Cyberpunk Red novels at all, or is that kind of still a, a gray area when it comes to the IP? Um, not particularly. Uh, um, and the, the, the simple truth of the matter is, is um, it, you know, Shadowrun and Battletech have de done decently with their novel lines. Uh Basically, I'm not going to say not based on just sheer momentum, but there, there's a there's an element to that. You know, they've been there for a while. They've been doing it. Um, but game line novels uh, tend not to do great, and they they drain resources. Uh, you know, we could work on novels, or we could work with the writer on novels. We could work on games. We're choosing to work on games. Uh, there will be a 2077 novel coming out. Uh, yeah, we that. talked about that. yeah. So. Yeah, um, and the comics are coming out. Um, will there ever be more red fiction in one form or the other? Quite possibly. Um, but, you know, it, it, it comes really down to it right now. We're, we're making games. Uh, you know, it took us it took us a while to build up Steam to the point where we're, you know, we're looking at two to three products next year. Um, you know, we got a book out now, uh, and we want to focus on keeping that momentum going. Cool. Um, so we have also a bunch of lore and rule questions, but I think, okay. um, there's also well, one yeah. other question that's not necessarily related to the lore rules, but, um, okay. do you watch any of the red actual plays? And if yes, you do, I watch any of them. That's part of my job. <laughs> What's, um, so, do you have any uh, recommendations? Yes. So as our, um, we, we have a, a, if you go to artilesorientgames.com and you look in the menu, you'll find, I think it's like under features, site features, there is a list of actual plays, which is in a Google Sheets spreadsheet uh, by system. So you can get 2020, Red, Witcher, Teenagers from Outer Space. There's some really cool ones for that. Um, Falconstein and a Mekton uh, actual play. Oh, wow. I think I just activated my Siri by accident. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um uh so uh the welcome to the dark future um so uh, uh you'll find a full list there uh every one of those are ones i have personally vetted which means i have watched at least two or three episodes of it to make sure that it is you know not full of horrible racist stuff or you know that's it. I, I can't speak i will not speak to the quality of it and of anything on that list in terms of you know like is it critical role versus a bunch of people that are happily playing just happen to be recording themselves uh you have to decide for that but i can guarantee that it is not hopefully going to be 
super offensive uh, quartz table. Uh, that being said, there are some very good ones. Uh, uh, of course, there are the groups uh, you can work with uh, over at Cyber uh, Nation Uncensored. They do uh, Rob's running like what twenty games a week. Yeah, um, <laughs> something like that. Prodigious. <laughs> Uh, he's done some really great stuff with Sirenscape. Uh, the, the Sirenscape games, uh, sponsor games especially, I think, uh, have a wonderful con a continuity uh, at this point that they're their own universe. That's really fun. He's working with some good people. He's, some of the people he's working with are from Roll to Cast. Um, the people at Roll to Cast are an Australian group. They are fan freaking tastic. Uh, they are, you know, up there professional. Uh, they do like half hour chunk episodes with full editing and music and uh they're all professional uh uh, uh performers so it is See, a they, lot of fun to do they but, honestly come out sounding almost like a radio drama they do it but the cool thing is they don't you know cut out the rules um which is nice like for example they have some great examples of net running uh, yeah in cyberpunk red so they run a 2020 game and a red game i recommend those that's called roll the cast um there is uh, Dark Future Dice. Uh, they are also edited, also music. Um, they start out in 2020. They switch to red in their third season. They have a side season where they play a couple of exotics, uh, uh, a bunny and a shark. Um, they uh, <laughs> they do some cool stuff. Uh, they start off with only the GM. Sure, going not sure that's I've never played a game before, and it's super goofy. But it is fun, so if you want something more like on the fun, you grow with them scale, and with a lot of episodes. And uh, there is... Uh, oof, sorry, um, my brain is blanking on names. Let me look at my podcast list real <laughs> quick. Uh, no latency. Um, now, they, uh, they do get into a lot of house ruling, and they do a lot of... Um, uh, world building that's outside of uh, very traditional cyberpunk. For example, they have anti-grav at some point. Uh, also good. They just finished their first season. Uh, they're also a podcast. Very good. Um, John John DeWise's stuff is solid. Um, and then there is a new one that just came out that is looking good. Um, I haven't watched more than a half of the first episode, but it is looking good so far. And it is... Um, one second. Uh, it's called Infinite Sided Dice, Cyberpunk Edge of Extinction. Uh, it's one of those, you know, they got together, they had some real cool professional uh, setting. Uh, it's on YouTube right now. They had some professional, you know, sound sets, uh, and it's looking good. Also, uh, going back to 2020 real quick, uh, PlayStation Access, uh, which is a you know, primarily a, place, a British PlayStation channel did a very cool Cyberpunk 2020 game, uh, and uh, if, yeah, that is a lot of it's a lot of fun. Um, it, uh, and uh, in fact, one of the characters from it made it into Cyberpunk Red. We liked her so much. Uh, Phoenix Redwind uh, runs a clinic. She is in Cyberpunk Red on the in the badasses section of the Night City chapter. Uh, she she is a uh, she uh, started off as a character in that. There is. Um, uh, Polygon did a Jumpstart Kit campaign, which is wacky but fun. And uh, they actually did a full campaign with multiple episodes. Yeah, they did a couple. Of, I think they did two or three episodes. Because I remember there was um, one with Mike. Uh, no, this is not. That was IGN. This is Polygon. Um, they have okay. a. They have a. They have or had. I don't know if they still have it. A series where they play board games or role playing games. They did two Jumpstarts. Now uh, Mike did run for IGN. Mike has run several sessions for the, what we call the uh, Team Monster. Yes. Which is uh, Norbeerham and Luke Gygax. Gax, yeah. And oh, Matt Lealert. Recognizably, or... Matt Lealert, a.k.a. Shaggy, a.k.a. Serial Killer. And him playing a version of Serial Killer in it. Quite a bit of fun, and that's a lot of fun. Now, one of the interesting things about Mike's game is Mike is happy to break the rules for the rules. <laughs> um, so oh yeah. If you're if you're watching that game to learn the rules, just be aware, Mike uh, is the kind of GM who will happily skip right past rules. Yes. Uh, if he thinks that it's a it's a cool thing to do, and you know that's that's his style. Yeah, that's that's the one thing when I played in his games, um, he he would just 
make up the rules on the fly and you know being a, a 2020 or it's like i don't think that's how the rules work but you're mike and you wrote the game you're so mike <laughs> yeah. well, and that's the thing is uh interlock as a whole is very easily hackable but more importantly especially at conventions and for yes. actual plays well i had one player started arguing with him like that's not how that works he's like i wrote the game <laughs> yeah yeah don't, don't don't tell your grandfather how to um but yeah um if you want to learn the rules i recommend uh, uh bob's games john john's games and uh roll to cast as those are pretty straight on uh if you want to just have fun with the flavor all of them are good and those all except for the, the last one i mentioned with the uh the new one those are all on that spreadsheet i mentioned on our website yeah, there's actually two that I don't see on your spreadsheet, but I started getting into, this was nine years ago, even before Red. Um, there's a, a channel called Tabletop Talk. They did a Cyberpunk 2020 and Die Party also had a, a Cyberpunk 2020 campaign. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple older ones. I, I tried to include <coughs> where I can, and yeah. after a while it got... <laughs> yeah, old. try to keep track of all of them. I can imagine. I, I'm happy to say there's now enough of them that I can't, you know, just wash them all whenever I want. It used to be that I could, you know, carve out a few hours each week, and yes. now uh, I can't, and I, that is not a bad thing. It's it's like the internet. You used to be able to go to every single site on the internet at one point that they could yep. actually put them all in the book. Now, no, not so much. <laughs> It's 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 you, you we're literally drowning in in material and it's it's a great thing. Definitely, it is. it's wonderful to see so many people enjoying Cyberpunk Red and Witcher and other games. Yes. So, I guess we can wrap it up here. Um, again, there's going to be we're going to have him on uh, Jay on again because um, he's already said he's willing to uh, come hang out with us next year. So yeah. we'll set that up, um, and and we, we can will. get through the rest of the questions yep. and get more questions and just. I. Go ahead. I do have a real quick question because it's something that's happening right now. Okay. Um, like literally right now. Comic, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, uh, comic writer Gail Simone has expressed uh, has expressed working with Artel Sorian Games. Is, is, oh, that, yeah. is that something that's happening? Um, I mean, I love her almost as much as I love you guys. So, Gail is super awesome. Uh, somewhere out there is a game of Castle Falcon and I ran that she played in. Um, I, I, I know. I, her, I watched that very closely. Uh, her, Mercedes Lackey, and Chris Spivey, um, and um, Mary Dixon. Uh, the answer is uh, there is nothing I can talk about there. Um, she's expressed. <laughs> she has said she'd love to. So, so. People will say all the time, I would love to be involved in your project. Uh, you know, I don't want to say famous people will, but, you know, like you'll see an actor say, oh, I would love to work with so-and-so, a director, right? And they never do. Um, so she has expressed interest. But her saying, I would love to do it, and then us being able to, A, uh, A whatever rate she would require, because I'm sure she would require. Um, not saying that we pay our writers poorly, but uh, she is a world-famous, super-famous comic writer. Um, and a television writer, and that's a little different. Uh, also, um, whether she would have time uh, to uh, do so. Now, uh, uh, certain, certain, we'd be silly not to pursue at some point, so we'll see. We will see what happens. I will say yeah, that I just, Mike saw that, and Mike has ideas. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I love seeing my different loves in life intersect like that. Uh, yeah. Kind of like when... Gail is my Twitter hero. Yeah, she's uh, her and Bill Sienkiewicz are just they're they're my comic book idols right now. All right, so I think we're kind of at an end. Um, so I know we've been asking you questions, but do you have any questions for me or or wisdom here? Oof. Okay. Um. Let us ask a question. You know <laughs> what? If if there is one thing in red that you pick out and you say, "Hey, this is this is the cool cyberpunk thing," 
It could be in the core rulebook, it could be at the DLCs, but this is the thing, this is the thing I look at it and I go, oh man, yeah. And it's new, it's not like, you know, something right from 2020, uh, where we, you know, we, you know, it's not the piece of lore from 2020, that was already in 2020. What would it be? Uh, for me, the thing, I, I'm going to put it in a caveat. I like what you guys did with special abilities, except for two yeah. of the roles. Law to the Walmart and, <laughs> yeah. and exact. Oh, exact. <laughs> okay. So yeah, because those so, tie into that character has to have a job to have those um, abilities. And in so my opinion, in of... well, in my opinion, in in a game, it shouldn't matter if a character has has a job or not, because that was the one but, thing with with 2020 is. Hey, roll a die. Guess what? You're unemployed, right? Um, that is, in that the, concept. The unemployment die is the, the unemployment die is gone. Um, yes. That's fair. Cool. Okay, that's fair. I uh, I love the entire concept of the night markets. I I I, I just it it's such a great little thing to have all these little pockets. That, you know, I mean, they're they're very representative of, you know, what real cities are like, where you have these cultural pockets of, you know, little bazaars and whatnot. Um, I, I so, think so, they were a very welcome addition. So, so to reward that, I'll give you a sneak, a little bit of sneak peek of, of Black Realm. Hey, uh, I will say, uh, I know a lot of people, you know, not every role is for everyone, and that's cool. Um, I agree with you. You know, that's that goes back to the brutality, right? With um, with Cyberpunk 2020, you know, you can lose an arm, you can very easily, or you can lose your head, uh, you can lose your job. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but for for the for the night markets, because I enjoy night markets too. I'll tell I'll tell you where each of the six night markets take place. There are six night Ooh. markets in Black Chrome. Uh, one is in an abandoned parking garage. One. Oh. Is in above or ball. below 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 ground uh, the, the parking garage one is below ground okay. one is in an abandoned mall that has already been visited in cyberpunk red uh we've already been there once uh in fact in fact i believe all the fixers in cyberpunk red have been mentioned somewhere already in the product one is upstairs in short circuit uh -huh. one is above the atlantis one is uh, in a mostly abandoned cul-de-sac. Sorry, in a cul-de-sac in a mostly abandoned Beaver Hill. Um, well, before you continue, I'm like picturing it in uh, the 2077, right? Yeah. The, okay. the various I... environments there. You're not far, you're not far off uh, yeah. in those. Um, and then one is in, it's, it's it is, in a casino that is in a basement. Yeah, I, I know um, exactly I mean, all those honestly, places in 2077. It, if you could see my face as you started lifting all, uh, listing all this stuff, it, it's it's very much a real world uh, uh, version of the popular meme with the wrestling owner, where it just gets better and better. Oh yeah, no, it, was, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, we brought in uh, we brought in several writers, uh, but yes, a, a, all six fixers have shown up somewhere before in um, in some cyberpunk red product or another. They're all uh, we want. We wanted to you know we didn't want to keep you know. We, it's fun to have twenty thousand fixers, but it's more fun to focus on a few. Uh, none of them are Hornet, unfortunately, um, which is a shame. But we just. Not selling a lot of chemical weapons and virus and, and lethal bioweapons uh, in black chrome. We'll, we'll save that for, for pandemic chrome. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I think I've, I've we've already mentioned three pieces in it. That's the one above Short Circuit because he owns it with his husband, uh, Rain. Uh, but you also uh, meet uh, Molly Anderson, who shows up, who's one of the residents of the apartment in the Jumpstart Kit. Uh, yeah. Mina, who is a exotic biosculpt, uh, bird biosculpt, um, from the Tales of the Red, um, 
adventure uh, stitched to wear. Uh, Mr. Kernigan, uh, who is, he, he gets a midnight market. He's really special. Um, Rex Royale, who is also from the Jumpstart Kick. Um, Woodchipper, uh, who you meet in the DLCs. Uh, she is a, an Amazon of a woman, thanks to her implanted linear, linear frame. Uh, and also a uh, nomad fixer. And did I miss? I, I choose three piece. Is that six? Ollie, three uh, piece. Uh, Ina, turn again. Which Yeah, yeah that's, that's six. That's six. Yeah. So there's six, six fixers, six uh, night markets uh, with the map and a description of where it is, how you get an invitation, what, it's, what it generally sells. Um, how fixers, PC fixers, can get like in on the action and take part in the night market as a fixer as opposed to a customer. Um, <laughs> Once again, I am the living embodiment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what their security is like and how often it's held. So you know we, we want these because so if you're running Cyberpunk Red, your night market can just be a oh well I need this this and this. Okay, we go down to the night market, get it and done, and we move on to the next venture. But, in my opinion, if you're running Cyberpunk Red right, a night market is not a store. A night market is a cultural experience. You go there, yes. you meet people, you hang out with people, you see people you don't normally see, you bargain, you haggle, you catch someone shoplifting. Uh, there should be all kinds of cool stuff happening. It should be going, it should be like almost like going to a carnival or a street fair. In fact, Woodchippers is basically a street fair, that cul-de-sac one. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just... She has, she has a band playing on stage. You can buy drinks. Because you know what? It's just like going to the mall, right? You know, you go to the mall. Why do they have a food court? Not because they want to feed you. But because if you have lunch there, you'll be there longer. You'll buy more. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, 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 like, uh, it's like going to a farmer's market. Uh, except yeah. for edge runner gear and contacts yeah. and, and entertainment and yeah, yeah like exactly. i said by far the night markets are my favorite part i mean really that's i i can't even think about it without coming up with a hundred different story ideas <laughs> yeah, designing the night market was, was a lot of fun yeah it's definitely a great system too um so that's it uh we're definitely going to have you back um so hopefully sometime next year when the end of year ends and you start ramping up for the new year and get some time. Um, but I want to thank you, Jay, for uh, attending uh, us two grognards uh, talking about cyberpunk. And uh, I appreciate your time. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned watching Saturday morning cartoons. Um, so Before that, the that podcast, yeah. I am. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so yeah, I was I was doing games uh, way back when uh, uh, in, in the in the uh, in, in the time in the, in the four times when, uh, when presidents had four letters in their last name. <laughs> yep. All right. But great. great. Thank you for having me. Thanks, man. Jay, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to finally get to talk to you. Um, yeah. I can't wait to have you back. I, I'm looking forward to it. It's a lot all of right. fun. And thank you all for attending and uh, listening to us uh, ramble on. Um, we also would like to uh, thank uh, Rob Mulligan over at uh, Cyberpunk Un Uncensored, Cyberpunk Un Nation Uncensored, <laughs> for hosting us. Um, check him out at cybernationuncensored.com uh, with his stuff, as well as the Discord he has. Um, you can check me out on my site, which is cybersmiley.net. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, little utilities that help not only with Cyberpunk 2020, but with uh, Cyberpunk Red. I hang out in a bunch of discords as well as Reddit. Um, so if you see me there, by all means, hit me up. Uh, I am Wisdom. Uh, thank you all for, for coming and joining us today. Uh, <coughs> You can catch me on my site, Data Fortress 2020. It's just a little cyberpunk site. Um, 
You can also hit us up, like he said, on Discord. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Um, and, you know, my email's out there. There's any any interaction we can get uh, with you guys, uh, we always look forward to. And, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah. Please. And, of course, Jay Gray uh, from Our Talsorian. Uh, I think you can check him out on quite a few things. If, if, it's Art, if you're talking Our Talsorian games online, that is me. There you go. Yeah, he, that, he is that the simply. public face of the company. Yeah, as weird as it sounds. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, hang out. Um, and, yeah, check out, check out their sites because they are storied lore of cyberpunk awesomeness going back to the days of yore. Oh, my God, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. All right. No problem. Have a great night, everyone.